Sound Particles is introducing a different approach to panning with Energy Panner, a plugin that uses the intensity of sounds to control their movement around you. With just a few clicks, add motion to sound effects, make music elements pop, and so much more. From stereo to immersive, Energy Panner is the perfect addition to any sound professional's toolkit. Available now at soundparticles.com. Sound Particles is bringing you another way to pan your sounds with Brightness Panner. The plugin uses the frequency content of sounds to move them around you. Imagine panning being controlled by the sound's brightness, pitch, or even by MIDI notes. With just a few clicks, add motion to your melodies, sound effects, or virtual instruments. From stereo to immersive, this is a powerful and innovative tool to bring your mixes to life. Now available at soundparticles.com. When working in stereo, panning with knobs is perfectly fine. However, when working with surround or 3D sound, even when using joysticks, it's much harder to get the results you're looking for. Wouldn't it be easier to just point to where you want your sound to be? Space Controller is here to revolutionize the way you pan your sounds. Use your mobile device as a movement reader and the sounds will follow. By connecting your mobile device with any DAW, our new product offers you a highly efficient and intuitive way to control sound with the palm of your hand. Every movement you can imagine giving to your sound is now possible, easier than ever, and just a touch away. Don't take our word for it. Try it now at soundparticles.com. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from. My name is Yolanda, and I'm part of the Sound Particles team. And thank you so much for joining us on uh, our first ever webinar. So if there are any technical issues, please be sure that it is on purpose. It's definitely not a mistake. <laughs> so just bear with us on this, our first experience. Um, this webinar that we're bringing to you tonight is, of course, all you need to know about 3D audio. Uh, and before we get into that, I just have some information to give you. Um, so, of course, we have divided this webinar into two parts. Um, the one for today will be focused on channel-based audio and object-based audio. Uh, and next week, on the 21st, we will be talking about ambisonics and binaural, and you will be able to register to that one very shortly. Um, so, uh, let me introduce you to our speaker. He is Nuno Fonseca, the creator of Sound Particle Software and the company. He's also my boss, so I'm not legally allowed to say anything bad about him. Uh, but he uh, is a former, former university professor, so that means he knows how to teach, which is good for this webinar. Um, and he also has a lot of experience uh, writing books and 20, over 20 papers on audio technology. So um, just a quick reminder, uh, at the end of this presentation, we will be having um, a Q&A. So if you have any questions along the way, make sure to write them down in the chat. And then at the end of the session, we will go over all of them together. So I would like to, uh, to introduce our speaker, Nuno Fonseca, so that they can um, tell us uh, all we need to know about 3D audio. So, hi everyone. It's always a pleasure to uh, talk about 3D audio and special audio. It's a, a, a passion that I have and all the team here at Sound Particles. Um, so, today we are going to focus uh, mainly on channel based audio and object based audio. We're going to start from stereo to 22.2, and then Dolby Atmos. And the idea today is not to show products or show how to use this product or that product uh, either 
hours or from others. No, the idea is to talk about the concepts for everyone to understand exactly what are the difference, what are the advantages and disadvantages of all of these different formats, because there isn't a single format that is best in every single scenario. So let's start uh, and dive in into the, this amazing world of 3D audio. So let's start with channel-based audio and let's start with the most simple one. So we have stereo, so two speakers, and we have left and right speaker. And what happens is that if you send the exactly same audio to both speakers, that will actually create a, a phantom image somewhere in the middle. So although there isn't any speaker in the middle, we're going to perceive a sound that's coming from the middle in between those speakers. And of course, if you start changing the volume between one speaker and the other, you can make that sound, uh, virtual sound source, this phantom image to start moving in between speakers. So two speakers allows you to create sounds and put sounds anywhere in between uh, them. Also, when we talk about stereo, uh, usually we are talking about using a, an angle of 60 degrees, which means that you create this perfect triangle with equal sides as you see on the image. And why 60 degrees? Well, of course, you can have a much narrow angle. You could put the, the speakers close to each other, but it's going to have a much narrow sound image. It's almost like watching a movie on a small television. So we want to have the widest possible image uh, to be able to put things and uh, paint this canvas in terms of sound. Um, but what happens is that after you increasing too much and uh, putting the speakers too far apart one from each other, at some point, for instance, imagine like 90 degrees or something like that, what is going to happen is that the sound image is going to collapse. Uh, and instead of having a phantom uh, sound source coming from the, from the middle, what happens is you know start to perceive two sounds, one from the left and another coming from the right and nothing coming from the middle. So that means that you are ruining the, the, the phantom image, the sound image of the stereo and it's not going to work anymore. So usually we tend to use around 60 degrees. Also, at some point, someone decided, okay, let's add a new, uh, a new speaker, a center speaker in between left and right. And probably you are thinking, okay, but why do you need this center speaker? We have left and right. We know that instead you can simply use these two channels to put sounds in between. So what is the need for one additional speaker? Well. Essentially, it's because the world is not a perfect place. And in spatial audio, that means that not everyone can stay on the sweet spot. So if you are on the sweet spot, you probably don't miss a lot by having, uh, you don't need the, the center speaker. Uh, and I even have heard world-class mixers working in mixing music in surround say, okay, I don't use the center speaker because I don't miss it. But the problem is that if you are not on the sweet spot, it's going to make a difference. So imagine that you are uh, on the movie theater with a very large screen, uh, and usually this the left and right speakers are usually close to the edges of the screen. So essentially, you are a very big screen. Or imagine that you are too close to the screen, which means that you no longer have this 60 degree angle between the left and right speaker. So by having this additional speaker, you have almost like an additional anchor that is there. It fills the completely sound field in front of you, doesn't create holes, even if you don't, if you have much more than 60 degrees between those uh, edge speakers um, and act as an anchor. Even if you are too much to the side, all of this allows you to have a much more uh, sound image with you. Also, at some point, someone decided, okay, let's add more speakers and start to explore other zones besides the, the frontal image. So we have these surround speakers. Initially, we started by having this left, center, right surround, which means that it was only one audio channel that was reproduced by two speakers, the left and right surround speaker. Uh, so they were playing exactly the same thing. Uh, but then later on with 5.1, you start having two independent uh, signals, one for the left, another for the, the right surround. Um, also, one of the things that you have might notice is that on cinema, when you go to the movie theater, you don't have one left surround and one right surround speaker. You have an array of speakers over there. So, and why is the reason? Well, imagine that we are on the on the movie theater, okay, and you are more or less over there on the that red spot, you are on the suite, 
uh, spot and every if you add only one speaker for each one of the surrounds it doesn't make uh, quite uh, a difference but now imagine that you are over there on the blue spot okay what would happen is that you would have a lot of sounds coming from your right but this huge uh, void of sounds because you don't have any sounds coming from the, the left side or imagine that you are on that green spot and you are in the the last row in the movie theater everything comes from the front you don't have anything coming from the back the advantage of using arrays for surround is that in this case you have this blue that are all of them playing the exact same signal the left uh, surround and then the red ruby uh, speakers playing the, the right surround but it doesn't matter where you are because you have always speakers around you creating uh, the surround uh, sound uh, for you and that is much better in terms of experience of course you get a much more diffuse kind of sound it's much more difficult to uh, to understand exactly where does the sound come from but allows you to get a much better experience once again because not everyone on the movie theater can be on the, the sweet spot also at the same time movies decided okay we need much more impact on the low frequencies you know for that kind of explosions the earthquake and um, but what is the problem well humans are not very um, sensible to to low frequencies which means that you need a huge amount of power with high spl levels to humans to actually start listening to these low frequencies which means that okay we need much more power to be able to offer this kind of uh, experience with very good low frequencies in movies of course the obvious solution would say okay let's get bigger speakers let's have more powerful amplifiers and by doing this now we have enough power to drive those very crazy low frequencies and get this experience well there was a problem because once again remember that in these times we were talking about analog audio and um, so with analog uh, you have a, a, a limited dynamic range uh, the difference between the highest sound that you can play without clipping and then the, the noise floor was not very high which means that if you decide to place much bigger speakers and simply amplify much more what you are uh, putting in terms of uh, sound what would mean is that you need to put dialogues at a lower level because everything now it's too much amplified too much so the the dialogues must be uh, lower to have the same level as regular movies have. and by doing this you get the noise level that starts to increase and start creating a problem so the next obvious solution was okay let's create instead a single low frequency channel only for this low frequency kind of effect let's have a subwoofer and this subwoofer will have the extra power that we need uh, usually this this subwoofer plays the channels with plus 10 dbs regarding all the other channels so we know already that okay this channel is to be played much louder than all the other channels so we don't have the issue with dynamic range um, and also although you have you are placing all this low frequency material on a single speaker what happens is that humans are not very uh, sensible in detecting direct directions with low frequencies because low frequencies tend to diffract on the, your head so you don't get a lot of difference between left and right here also the timing difference between uh, left and right low frequencies are very slow waves so that delay also doesn't give you a lot of information so it's not an issue because we don't detect the location the direct the, the direction of sound with low frequencies so that was the the, the solution by using this lfe this low frequency effects kind of a, a solution instead of simply bigger speakers and more powerful amplifiers also just an additional note usually people tend to use lfe and subwoofer as the exactly the same thing there is a slightly uh, difference lfe is the name of the audio channel when you place this audio content uh, the subwoofer is the speaker that reproduces this and in some cases especially if you have a base management system uh, the signal of the lfe that enters the base management and the signal that is sent to the subwoofer is not exactly the same so if you uh, uh, want to be a lot a little more precise usually we call lfe to the audio channel and subwoofer to the speaker that reproduces the low frequency material also during these years we have several flavors of course besides 5.1 
at some point, Sony has released SDDS on the 90s. It was a 7.1 format with seven speakers, uh, with five speakers on the front and two on the surround. Especially we were, this was uh, uh, thinking about these huge screens uh, and having a lot of speakers to cover the entire screen. Um, later on, Dolby also released something called the Digital X with a 6.1 with a a center rear it was a matrix solution for this channel uh, but nonetheless it was something that happened but then we converge for the traditional 7.1 that we use nowadays with three speakers in front of us and then for surround channels with side and rear surrounds uh, to give this uh, much better experience everywhere and then we got to immersive audio and when you talk about immersive audio most of the times you're talking about surround plus height. So the idea is we have surround as having several speakers on this horizontal plane in front of you, in the back and the sides, all of those. But we tend to use immersive when we want to say, okay, we want also to add some height component, usually with speakers on the ceilings to get uh, uh, the, the feeling that the sound also comes from uh, above you. Of course, there are several formats. These are some of the, the expressions that you probably have heard like 7.1.2, 7.1.4 and so on. So usually the first two numbers continue to be the regular ones like 7.1, uh, but then the last, it's the number of speakers that you are going to use uh, on, the, on the ceiling. Uh, so in this case, 7.1.2 means 7.1, a traditional 7.1 with three in the front, four surround, and then a, a subwoofer uh, and then two speakers on the ceiling or four speakers on the ceiling on the left side on the right side so for instance you can see here on the image our studio right now so this is a 7.1.4 with four speakers uh, on the ceiling also there is other formats out there that is for instance Auro 3d with 11.1 and 13.1 so for instance on this image, we got 13.1. So it's a 7.1 uh, horizontal one. And then on top of that, you're going to have a 5.0 uh, with an elevation of around 30 degrees, so slightly elevated. And then you're going to have this final uh, speaker over here, right above you, that is usually called the voice of God for obvious reasons. Um, so this is one additional format you, you have IMAX 12.0 with 12 uh, um, speakers, uh, full uh, frequency response, which means that it doesn't use additional subwoofers. Uh, each channel can handle the, all the low frequency content. Or for instance, you have this NHK 22.2. NHK, it's the Japanese uh, TV station that created this format. And it's something like this. So you're going to have 10 speakers on the horizontal plane, so five in front of you on the screen, an additional five as surround. Then you're going to have 11 speakers above you, one right above your head, and then another eight around the edges of the, the ceiling. Also, there is um, three speakers below the horizontal plane, these green ones in front of you, and allows you to also give the sense of sounds coming from, uh, from the the, the, the ground uh, and also there is two subwoofers to reproduce the two LFE channels that this is uh, re receiving. So as you can see there is a lot uh, of formats out there from stereo to uh, immersive. Also just by curiosity for those that want to know a little more so exactly how does 3D panning work so it's pretty much like stereo so with stereo uh, you use uh, two speakers and then you control the the gain of each speaker to place the sound in between. With um, vector-based amplitude panning, VVAP, this is one of the most used 3D panning techniques that is some variations also. The idea is to use three speakers. So essentially all of the speakers that you see on the 7.1.2 or whatever, all of these in the computer, it's being triangled. So there is several triangles generated on the computer. And then when we want a sound source coming from a different a particular direction what you're going to do is okay which triangle of speakers are actually within this direction and then we control the the gain of each one of those pixels to make sure that the sound comes from that direction within the, the triangle 
So channel based audio. Like I mentioned in the beginning, there is pros and cons in every single format uh, out there. And um, the pros, the advantage of channel based audio, well, it's perfect if you already know the output layout that you are going to be used and you are 100% sure that you're never going to use or need any other layout for that uh, work that you have done. Channel based audio is perfect. So if you are creating something and you know, okay, I'm going to uh, use this. This is going to be listened in 5.1 all the time. I will never need stereo or 7.1 or anything else. So if you already know all of those things, what you're going to do is, okay, no problem. Uh, Channel-based audio is perfect for you. The problem is that if you actually need different layouts, the problem is that you need different mixes for all of those things. So if you are doing something, a movie or something else, and you know, okay, I'm going to, uh, these people, some people are going to listen in stereo, some will going to uh, try in 5.1 or 7.1. Well, that means that you're going to need a different mix for each one of those layouts. You're going to need a stereo mix for stereo, you're going to need a 5.1 mix for 5.1 and another mix for 7.1. Of course, there is a, some, um, there is some uh, up mixing, down mixing uh, tools, products that allows you to do things, but they are not perfect. They depend a lot in different kinds of qualities, uh, sound quality, but okay. Channel-based audio, if you know exactly the layout, it's perfect. The problem is if you need different layout, you need different kinds of mixes. And of course, this is going to, to cost you something. Okay, so the question is, would it be possible for us to, to have a format that doesn't depend on the output channel layout? Uh, like I'm doing my mix and then it doesn't matter if someone is listening in stereo or 5.1 or any crazy other layout, it would translate perfectly and I wouldn't need to worry about having multiple mixes. Well, that's the, the goal of object-based audio and ambisonics uh, that we are going to, to see object-based audio now, ambisonics next week. So let's now talk about object-based audio. So, Object-based audio. Um, so let's go slightly uh, uh, rewind a little. So when we have channel-based audio, what we do is something more or less like this that you see on the picture. So you have different sounds. Each one of those sounds is going to pass through a panner, okay? And the panner, you're going to tell where you want the sound to come from. And then the panner, based on that information, will know how much signal, how much of that sound should be placed on each one of the speakers. You mix everything on the bus, you distribute each one of those signals, you distribute the left, the right, the center, all of the speakers that you are using. And then during reproduction, each one of those signals are going to be reproduced by a speaker or by an array of speakers. And that's great. When we change for object-based audio, the concept is completely different. So what you're going to do is, we have all of our sounds, okay? But we are not going to mix sounds. We're going to distribute all of those sounds independently. Imagine that you have something and you have 20 tracks. Okay, we are not going to mix the tracks. We're going to distribute all of those tracks completely independent from each other, okay? Also, your panner are not going to change anything in the, the audio. It's simply sending information, some data, telling, okay, I want this sound to be coming from this direction. I want the sound coming from that direction and so on. So these sounds will come from different directions, but it's only information. We are not doing anything to the sound. And then we distribute all of this, the sounds independently, the information of the panners. And then during reproduction, depending on the speaker layout that the person has on the uh, room, the then is when we actually going to render things, when we are going to mix sounds together and say, okay, if this sound is to be listened from this direction, in this case, I have the speaker over there, the other over there. So I know exactly which signal I want to send to each uh, uh, speaker to make sure that I'm getting the sounds on the directions that I want. So once again, instead of mixing sounds to the output, uh, uh, channels that we want, okay? Instead of mixing everything uh, on the speakers like we do with channel-based audio, what we do is let's keep 
each channel completely independent, not mixed at all with all the others. Let's add some data about their position, and that is called the metadata. Usually metadata means data about the data. So we're going to send information, what is the 3D position that we want, if you want that sound to have a, a apparent size, so if it's almost like a pinpoint, very uh, precise direction, or if you want simply the sound coming from the front without telling if it's center or left. Simple. So we can say, oh, wow, how wide is that sound? You, of course, you can do automation, change the positions through time and all of those things. And then you're going to distribute all of these channels that now we call objects. And then during reproduction and only during reproduction, what you're going to do is, okay, based on the layout of the speakers that I have, based on the metadata that I receive from each channel, their position, size, and so on, then it's when the engine will actually decide what should be played in each of those speakers. So it's uh, everything done in real time based on all of this information. So once again, we have the studio, we have the panels, we don't mix anything. We simply distribute this. And when I talk about distribution, I'm talking about streaming or store this on files or eventually uh, having this available on the Blu-ray or whatever. And then during reproduction, that is when we actually start doing all of the work that needs to be done and make the decisions depending on the speaker layout. If I have a 5.1 system, okay, the system will play back the best that it can for a 5.1. If instead of that, I have 30 speakers around me, it's going to use the 30 speakers to make sure that you get the best sound from those 30 speakers. Of course, if you are on the studio, you need to also listen to what we are doing. And then you have something like uh, the, the, this reproduction system on the studio for you. Usually, for instance, in Dolby Atmos, it's called the RMU um, that will render all of this audio for you to also listen to what we are doing. But actually, what you are going to uh, send as a master is not, the sound is not mixed at all. Okay, so let's talk about Dolby Atmos because that's the most well-known format that we have in terms of object-based audio. So with Dolby Atmos, you can have up to 118 audio objects um, plus a 7.1.2 band. So Dolby Atmos supports both objects and channel-based audio, um, both. So he has a 7.1.2 band, that is a 7.1 uh, uh, channel-based audio. And then on top of that, it can have up to 118 all your objects, which mean monophonic sounds that are placed somewhere on your sound field. This means that it's able to handle 128 independent mono streams. So you have all of this uh, in mono being, being uh, uh, spread uh, everywhere. And as you can see, you're going to have 10, 10 channels used for the bed, seven plus one plus two, it's 10. Okay, and then the remaining 118 are used as all your objects. If you want, you can have more beds and less objects. So it's up to you to, if you want to do those kinds of things. Then during reproduction, you can have up to 64 independent speakers. And when I talk about independent speakers, I mean that you can have up to 64 speakers on the movie theater, each one playing sound that is completely different from all the others. So completely different sounds coming from each one of those 64 speakers. Of course, you can even have more if you use an array of speakers, but if you're using symbol speakers, you can have up to 64, as you can see, much more than a 5.1 or a 7.1. So when you go to a Dolby Atmos theater, of course, it's the traditional 5.1 or 7.1 uh, uh, movie theater. Well, the first thing that you're going to notice on the Dolby Atmos is of course, the speakers on the ceiling. It's going to have two rows of speakers on the ceiling, uh, one on the left, another on the side that are there to give you the sense of sound coming from uh, above and give you this uh, immersive experience. The second thing that is slightly less obvious is that with 5.1 and 7.1, usually the surrounds start more or less around one third of the room. So essentially this third doesn't have any kind of speakers and then these two thirds of the room starts with speakers on the back and then the other two thirds of the other wall. So with Dolby Atmos, what is going to happen is that you're going to have additional um, side speakers until 
until reaching the screen to make sure that there isn't any holes over there and you get a perfect 360 kind of sound uh, around you without having holes of, between the speaker, the, the screen and the, the initial speakers on the side. Finally, if you have a very large screen, there is this optional two speakers over there, the center left and the center right, that are there to give uh, to fill even more the, the gaps if you have a, a large screen uh, like uh, I mentioned. The other thing that, because sometimes when people think about Dolby Atmos, they think, okay, it's having sound above you. Okay, of course, it, it has that feature, but it's something much more than that. So let's see an example. Imagine that you are mixing something and you have the sound of a car moving on the left side. You want the sound to start from the back on the left and then move to the front. How we do this in 5.1? Well, you start having the, the sound of the car on the left surround, which means that all of those speakers are going to play the sound of the car. And then when you change the panel, essentially what you are doing is simply say, okay, and but now I want to move the sound from this channel to the left channel. So essentially you're going to crossfade, going to decrease the sound of what is being reproduced by the the left surround speakers and then you start to increase the sound of the left speaker and you get this idea of the sound passing uh, from back to front on your left side when you change for dolby atmos what is going to happen is okay my car is over there okay i want them to move forward so if the car is over there that means that i'm going to place the sound of the car on that speaker okay and then Cars will start to move, and then I'm going to start moving the sound for the next speaker, okay? And then for the next one, another for the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and go on. So, usually, as you can see, instead of simply crossfading between the left surround and the left, you're going to crossfade between every single speaker there is until you reach the final destination. And of course, this gives you much more resolution in terms of space uh, and much more detailed kind of experience. Nonetheless, of course, imagine that you don't want the car to be a pinpoint kind of sound. Of course, it's not an issue. You can still say that, no, it's a, a large car. So it's going to use almost like a sound like this, like three speakers using at the same time. But nonetheless, even if you are using three speakers to make sure that the sound of the car is slightly wider, as you're moving these, you start with these three speakers, then you move for them, these three speakers, and then the other three, and the other three, and so on. So once again, even with that, you get a much more smoother and more precise resolution in terms of uh, space. So as we mentioned, Dolby Atmos also has the, the concept of beds, of channel-based audio. So besides objects, we can also continue to use channel-based audio on top of this and um, and on case of the atmos this means a 7.1.2 bed that you can use um, and then of course you can use beds for the traditional channel based uh, stems that you already have imagine that you are working on a, uh, on the the sound for a movie and imagine that someone has delivered the music the soundtrack already mixed in 7.1 so you can simply drop that over here so the the each one of those signals are going to be placed on the 7.1.2 bed. Or imagine someone that have recorded the soundscape uh, with uh, a 5.0 kind of setup. So you can have um, the sound designers give you, okay, this is the soundscape created in 5.1. So you can also place this on the, uh, on the bed. Um, so there are some materials that you can go directly and put that on bed. And of course, if you want much more detail, much more space resolution, of course, then you use objects to make sure that you get all of these advantages of object-based audio, like a car passing by, uh, people talking, but you want this to have a particular kind of movement, uh, or you want to use music, but you want to elevate and say, oh, no, I want the strings slightly higher, and then the voice over here. Um, so you can create whatever you work, want. And once again, by using beds and by using um, channel uh, objects at the same time. So object based audio, of course, we, we talk about Dolby Atmos, but there is other formats, RMAX, uh, DTS, X, MPEG, MPEG Edge, and others that use all of this. So regarding object based audio, 
when you're talking about object based audio, once again, there is pros and cons. And the pros is that it works with any layout, it's able to adapt to every layout. If you are reproducing something in, for instance, in Dolby Atmos and you only have uh, a 7.1.2 with 10 speakers on the on the your setup, it takes advantage of that. But if you, instead of having 10 speakers, you have 20 speakers, it also takes advantage of that and give you much more detailed uh, uh, information. And instead of that, if you use 64 speakers, you're going to have even more detailed kind of uh, reproduction of the, the, the system. So it's able to adapt to every kind of layout because like I mentioned, the render, the mixing is only done in the final stage during reproduction based on the layout that we have. And also the additional uh, advantage of object-based audio is that it gives you the best resolution. So if you are, if you have the speakers, if you add more speakers, you get more space resolution out of the system. What are the disadvantages? Well, you need to distribute a lot of channels because each channel uh, now needs to be uh, distributed. And if you are using a uh, theatrical uh, Dolby Atmos release, you can use 128 channels, but now you need to distribute these 128 channels. Of course, for a movie, it's relatively easy. It's the hard drive, the big file with that over there. But if you are streaming, there is a lot of channels that need to be streamed. Or if you are using a Blu-ray, there is a lot of um, channels that need to be there. And so most of the, sometimes, most of the times what happens is that you don't have the full 128 uh, uh, streams uh, out of every single Dolby Atmos box. Most of them like streaming or a Blu-ray as a, a limited number of objects, um, but using a bed and then for instance, eight objects uh, during reproduction. Also, there is eventually uh, a disadvantage because since you are going to have every single sound, input sound, it's completely separated and needs to be stored and distributed separately. Uh, this You have a limited budget of objects. So in Dolby Atmos, you have 118 uh, uh, objects as a maximum capacity. Of course, it's uh, very hard for people to use more than 128 channels most of the times, but there are situations where that uh, can easily be uh, overcome. Um, for instance, if you are all working, working with sound particles, we, generate sound fields with 10,000, 100,000, have renders up to 1 million sound sources playing at the same time. As you can imagine, it would not be possible to use that directly as object instead of using some kind of channel-based audio, some bets uh, in the middle. So in some cases, it could be a problem, this budget of objects, of course, is a big budget, 118, but it's nonetheless uh, a budget. Um, just one more curiosity. Um, this movie called Fantasia from Disney. Everyone knows the movie. It's Mickey Mouse with the wizard hat. Um, it was released in 1940. And um, because of the movie, it's essentially a sequence of uh, music clips that were animated. At the time, Walt Disney thought that the movie needed a special sound system for people to really uh, uh, enjoy uh, and the, the experience. So the Disney have created this thing called the Fanta Sound. So it was a, a sound system that was installed in several theaters and also went on tour through several cities of the United States and allowed uh, some people to uh, watch the movie with a better sound experience. So there were several models uh, that were created and built for the, the, the Fantasia. Okay, this is considered the first movie to use surround. Okay, because it's, it uses speakers on the left and right and center and the sides and all of those things. In some of the models of the Fanta sound, there was also a speaker on the ceiling, which means this is the first movie to use immersive audio. And the interesting part is how did they do it? So essentially what they did was they use a four track recording uh, recorder and that four track essentially kept three audio streams Okay, uh, different audio streams. And then the fourth channel uses a control signal that would control the way that these signals are going to be switched between all the speakers. So the first audio channel could be now being reproduced on the left speaker, but later on that first audio channel moves to the, to the side or some other thing. So as you can see, uh, 
for me, this is the first object-based audio uh, movie um, because the concepts of object-based audio are there. We have these independent audio streams that we store independently. We have the metadata that controls how this thing is uh, positioned. Of course, this is much more primitive than Dolby Atmos. This was analog, not digital, but nonetheless, uh, uh, for me, of course, this could be uh, something that people can argue about. But for me, this also is the first movie to use object-based audio. So for a movie that was created like 80 years ago, that was the first to use surround, first to use immersive, and first to use, use object-based audio, for me, I have to congratulate the people at Disney because at that time they were very on, on the edge of the, the things that now we take more or less for granted 80 years uh, later on. So this is a wrap up of the of this first uh, webinar. Uh, like we mentioned, next week we are going to talk about Amisonics and binaural. Amisonics it's a very uh, interesting sound format. It's most people think think about Amisonics almost like a black box with a lot of uh, black magic over there that people don't understand. So the idea is let's understand much better what is ambisonics and also let's talk about binaural that is using headphones and giving 3D uh, uh, um, experience using headphones and be able to uh, perceive sound coming from all directions using only the left and right regular uh, headphones. So don't, uh, don't miss uh, this upcoming uh, webinar. Um, tomorrow we're going to send the information to, to those that have registered today with information how to register for the upcoming event that is going to be uh, next week. Also, if you are very passionate about all of this uh, uh, technology and special audio and you simply cannot wait for next week, you can always uh, download our rebook. All you need to know about 3D audio, it's available in English, Japanese, and Chinese. So feel free to grab your free copy of the ebook if you really cannot wait uh, to know more about all of those things. And with all of that, let's now pass to uh, uh, some Q and A. Yeah, just um, feel free to jot down your questions in the chat box below um, so that Nuno can uh, go through them and answer them. And uh, just a quick side note, I want to thank everybody for being here from all over. I see people from Norway, from Kyoto watching at ungodly hours. <laughs> so thank you so much for uh, joining us um, and being here with us. So feel free to uh, let us know your questions. Okay, so let's start. Okay, will the recording be available yet later? Yes, we are going to send you the, the link with the recording for uh, you to to check it out if you want to uh, see it again or sh share it with anyone else. Um, so uh, are you going to sharing the slides of after the talk? We usually don't share the slides, but if you can, you can send me uh, uh, an email for info at soundparticles.com and you can send you the, the, the slides. Um, also, um, what 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 do you think of the BEP uh, technique? This might be perhaps to the second session, but out of curiosity. So the BEP, it's uh, it's uh, the base uh, of pretty much most of the, the the rending techniques that we use nowadays. Um, of course, there are other ways of doing this. You can also pan everything in Amisonics and then decode that to regular begins. Of course, the BEP is not perfect there are some slight variations that slightly improve the the techniques but um i would say that uh, as a, a starting point is a, a fantastic way to to paint sound in 3d um uh, okay uh let me see is this be on youtube replay if you missed anything so we're going to to send this everyone um some particle products are the best in the industry. Thank you. Uh, okay, let me see once again. Um, sharing the information. Let's see. Um, panning through. Um, okay, you mentioned panning through amplitude. Is using phase also possible? So um, you can also use phase uh, and uh, especially delays. Uh, if you let next session, we're going to talk about binaural and with binaural, 
timing is also quite important to give you uh, a sense of panning. In terms of if you are using speakers, um, phase is not as relevant because as you can see, the simple fact that you are slightly close to one speaker than the other, will, you, you automatically change the phase, but the sound image continues to be pretty much like that. So most of the times when you are working with speakers, uh, although you can do some things with phase, for instance, in stereo, if you invert the phase of one of the speakers, you can even create some effect outside the left and, and right. Uh, the, the sound image can even go be slightly uh, above the left and right speakers. Uh, but most of the time, we tend to use amplitude because once again if you are not on the sweet spot that's the, the a much better way to to handle uh, everything and everyone to have a much more similar um, experience um let's see will the talk be in the virtual are at some point um will be a webinar on some particles itself yeah it's a good idea uh, okay yolanda you can start thinking about uh, webinar for regarding sound particles itself uh it's a good idea okay uh, the translation of sound particles to immersive format final how can sound particles be factored into an object-based format workflow so currently sound particles uh, doesn't support um uh, object-based audio yet yet and um, we when we released sound particles uh, there wasn't any way to to have object-based format. In the meanwhile, there was ADM format coming out and be adopted in, in several systems. So what we're going to do is on the upcoming uh, version of sound particles is going to have ADM uh, um, format support, which means that you can either import objects into sound particles or, or you can export uh, from sound particles in objects and then import that into Pro Tools. So uh, in the future, we are going to be uh, uh, using that. Um, another question, will some particles ever work as a plugin within a DAW? Okay, what the problem with some particles being as a regular plugin is that there are um, plugin architectures are built in for regular effects like a delay, a compressor, uh, distortion, something like that, equalizer. And what we do some particles, it's a lot of things that would simply cannot be possible within as a, a regular and uh, digital audio station plugin. Nonetheless, what we are uh, keen to do in the, in the future is to improve the workflow between uh, sound particles and the door and to continue create some additional plugins uh, with some of the features that we uh, use uh, sound particles or some of the applications that you use sound particles to do certain things that we those things not everything but at least some of the things some of the applications that use some particles will then be able to use in the plugin of course we want to do so many things uh, but uh, we have uh, a small development team but nonetheless you know, we are working hard to bring all of those features uh, into, into that um where is the book located please so if you go to our website there is on the top uh, you have product and then there is one saying community and if you go to that menu that says community there is a, the the link over there for the ebook um what else uh, okay look forward okay so sound particles and dolby atmos what workflow would you recommend for laptop based sound designers so i would say that it depends if you are um, uh, if you are uh, doing things in music and you want to do things more creative logic probably could be an interesting choice if you are working in the laptop but more uh, audio post kind of work uh, pro tools is the, the way to do it and then using sound particles export from sound particles as different stems and then by doing this for instance imagine that you say okay let's have my sound field in sound particles export as 7.1.2 and then import as a stem or even multiple stems uh, uh, into into the the, the the system okay can you send the link of the download okay so uh, yolanda if you can please uh, you can even copy paste here the, the link for people if they want to see how to download the ebook okay um okay okay let's see uh, what can you talk about about the rendering processes is software or hardware thank you so most of the times when you're talking about this render process on object-based audio uh 
Uh, of course, most of the times this is done by software, although currently sometimes it's difficult to say what is software and is hardware because even software runs on hardware even. Um, so, but it depends, of course, if you are having a consumer product, uh, you are at home with uh, some with support, you have some speakers and Dolby Atmos decoder, of course, that is usually done by uh, hardware, although sometimes the hardware is the computer <laughs> there that you don't see it, uh, but it's uh, done by hardware. Um, uh, if you go to a movie theater, most of the times it's uh, uh, RMU, and the render it's also by hardware, not a regular uh, computer. Uh, but if you are doing post-production, most of the times it's a computer that handles all of those things. Um, Okay, on object audio, is the final result pre-rendered or is rendered on the fly in the theater? It's rendered on the fly in the theater. Unless you're talking about the bed and the beds are already mixed like channel-based audio. So those channels of the beds are already done and simply you send them to the, you simply send them directly to the, to the corresponding speakers. All the others, all the objects are rendered only during playback on the theater, on the living room, whatever you are using. Uh, doing the, the playback and that depending on the layout that's when the, all the render is done um thoughts on weight speakers being different frequency response that don't on the front plan to save costs on building a room i personally like uh, i would prefer like speakers to to have the exact model like everything else uh, of course um i am a but that's why I am so passionate about special audio. For me, all the speakers should be exactly uh, uh, the same. Um, even here, we are changing the, the speakers to be exactly the same format, uh, exactly the same model. Um, but I understand that sometimes if you are a studio that uh, does a lot of work in stereo, probably you have, uh, it makes sense to, to have a better left and right speaker than all the others because it's so many. Uh, but for me, uh, if you are keen about the best the experience, I would recommend try to get the, the exact model for all the, the speakers. And if you cannot have the exact model, uh, uh, because if you, sometimes it's not only about the different frequency response, it's also different kind of uh, the levels in between speakers. So you need to be, make sure that you are able to get everything smooth. And if a sound is moving around, it doesn't change the timbre. Uh, or change the equalization. So uh, I would personally prefer uh, 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 a studio with the exact same model everywhere, but okay, I know that it's a much more demanding uh, kind of solution. Um, can you tell anything about how, how object-based audio work in video games? In video games is something more or less uh, similar. So essentially the video games simply tell the coordinate and then Dolby Atmos engine is there to make sure that he translates everything to, to the system if it's using binaural or the speakers or all of those things. Um, is there an analyze to see the 3D spectrogram from all speakers? Uh, no, um, I don't, at least I don't know a way to, to, to analyze the 3D spectrogram of all the speakers. Um, you mentioned 3D audio mostly in the context of movies, which other future area will be evolving? So very good question. Um, when you're talking, most of people think about 3D audio about movies, they say, okay, yes, I'm seeing uh, uh, the point of having sounds coming to the sides, it's a battle, it's a, a helicopter flying by, okay, but I'm working in music and I don't want a guitar to playing around or having a drums on the back or something like that. The interesting thing is that, of course, if you want to do crazy things with music, you can, okay. Uh, but even if you continue to put everything in front of you and you use all of the surround speakers and all the height speakers only to place reverb uh, reflections, I assure you that the quality of the experience is completely different, okay. Even once again, even if you continue to have all the musicians, everything in front of you and not having guitars spinning around and do crazy things. If if you have, no, no, it's classical music or it's jazz or it's pop, but I want everything on the front as a regular uh, uh, thing. So even if you don't want to go crazy, doing so, the simple fact that you have different speakers on the surrounds or 
above you and you are able to place with a good reverb unit different kind of reflections there it makes all the difference uh, you if what i would suggest is try to go to a studio with a, a good uh, Dolby atmos system uh, place some music with good reverbs and simply uh, uh, mute the height and the surrounds and you completely feel that is a completely kind of uh, of, of a, a solution so uh, uh, once again even in music i think there is so much thing that you can do with special audio okay so does the similarity between sound particles and some visual effect software is there any way connecting the sound and light effects on in the same software so of course with sound particles the idea of sound particles is uh, very similar to the idea of uh, cgi computing uh, uh, computer graphics we sound particles is uh, the kind of the same uh, approach uh, and yes there is some features in sound particles of that you can use one of them is to import cgi information if you have a scene in cgi and animation you can import into sound particles and have automatically all the automation built in because you know how the camera move or the, the sounds move so everything is over there um interested about integration between sound particles and Dolby atoms so you need to wait for the upcoming version it's going to uh, uh, be quite interesting because it's going to be able to do this integration with all the atoms and objects and having these sounds highly detailed in all the atoms so don't miss it uh, and greetings um do you think music will eventually evolve from standard binaural and become the standard i think music will evolve to binaural but you we still have a binaural that needs to be fixed i'm going to talk about all of that next week uh, i think that we are we don't have yet a very good binaural uh, solutions um that give you the sense of uh, the real thing so i i think it's a handicap so nowadays you need to choose if you want stereo with the best frequency response but worst spatial in experience or you want uh, special music with the best uh, with the best spatial experience, but with the eventually not the best frequency response um, and equalization. So, but I think we still have a problem, uh, but if we fix that problem, definitely it's going to be the, the, the future, but I have a biased opinion, of course. Um, so as you see any path forward from channel-based audio production distribution that is based on open source, the one that doesn't require recurrence or software, version not always, okay. To be honest, um, there is already um, a lot of uh, solutions that use channel-based audio that even don't require uh, Dolby Atmos. Uh, I think there is now several formats that now support PCM directly, so which means that you don't even need to encode uh, things in Dolby Digital uh, or DTS or RO, so you can use that directly. Although those systems, it's uh, focus on 5.1 i believe that they support 5.1 of course this is not my uh, uh, my major uh, area of expertise but i believe there is already some pcm formats that you can use in movie distribution without needing dolby atmos dts and our okay but if you want to go for spatial not yet you still need some kind of uh, uh, investment on that areas um i'd like to know more about all the production for vr okay well uh, if we are if you are keen to know more about production for vr you definitely need to come for the next session because ambisonics it's all about uh it's the major format for vr and binaural of course also quite important for vr so definitely if you want to to know more about vr you definitely need to come uh next week what are your thoughts on all the atmos versus uh, Apple special audio as far as implementation of translation of object metadata. And um, so, once again, when you're talking about binaural, it's not perfect yet. You need the personalization and you need very good personalization. It's not only a matter of uh, doing a slight personalization, no, it's much more than that. Uh, but next week, we're going to talk about that in detail. Um, okay, to go to the card and then you from the sound uh, is something like okay, i just record another panic track another and uh, to pen the sound left and right this pen no so if the question is okay i have recorded a guitar adding a panning track and then made 
use a, a saw wave to pan the sound left and right. This is object-based audio. No, this is, you are still doing something in channel-based audio, although you are controlling the panel with something else. And this is already being rendered on your uh, computer. For object-based audio, for this to work in object-based audio, we would need to be able to adapt to, for instance, um, three speakers on the front, or eventually if you have five speakers on the front to be able to switch between uh, left, center, left, center, center, right, right, and back and forward. So you would need, it's a, much more than that. You need to be able to uh, export all the sound independently and then render and pen the sound exactly during reproduction. Okay, um, is there any integration with all the atmos? I assume that is regarding sound particles. Um, can sound particles be used in a live performance environment? Not yet. Uh, um, so far, you need to render everything and make everything. Uh, but we are working on having some particles uh, working on our live scenarios. Um, it would be possible to, to send the track to physical channels, route them out of the door. Um, it will be possible sometimes to send its track to physical channels to route them out of the door. I confess I didn't understand very well this question. Um, um, okay, to, um, yeah, to integrate with DAW, you could use isotope send and back option as with ceremony. Yes, there is a, a solution, although with isotope, it's easier because you get pretty much the same duration. You get a clip, you send to isotope, you edit and then move back to the exact position with the pretty much more or less the, the same uh, size. With sound particles, it's slightly more complicated than that because you need to get something, create something with a completely different duration. You would need to, on the audio suite, we have to say, no, no, you need more extra five, uh, 10 seconds because this is much larger than the original clip. So we have been working on something like that, but it's not as uh, on the case of isotope it's easier because it's pretty much the same clip just being changed and with sound particles it's more a, a creative bringing different tracks different audio material and having a, a clip that has five seconds and turning that into 30 seconds or something like that so we have tried but we are continue to working on that. Uh, will be a tutorial of course, course about using some particles to make uh, some detailed cases. We'd like to learn more about the usage. Okay, so once again, very good idea. Let's in the future create some webinar regarding some particles. Um, uh, uh, okay, we should want to know which recent papers there are about object-based audio. Well, a lot of things about object-based audio are from Dolby and they are not usually uh, um, um, having a lot of papers. Nonetheless, you can always try to go to AES and uh, try to uh, to search for object-based audio on the AES library. So I would say that most papers will probably show up over there. Um, will some particles have a review within the audio section in the future? Will um, all these arrays of speakers can translate to headphones, um, or can we really get a similar feeling in immersive audio using headphones? Okay, so regarding headphones, we're going to talk much more uh, over the next uh, over the next uh, week. Uh, okay, there is the link. Okay, uh, object is that a final result pre render is rendered on the fly. Okay, it's okay. Um, will you be at NAM at LA? Yes, we'll be at NAM, and I also be there. Uh, if we want to dive deep on the subject, okay, uh, object based, uh, some room and impulse model anytime soon. Um, not soon, firstly, but we'll definitely uh, are, want to work with that. Uh, do, are they actually rendered or this is more about being played back according to the meta? So, once again, with objects, they are not rendered at the studio, they are send it completely different different channels independently and then they are rendered in the in the during playback even especially in broadcasting television there is even the, the ability because since we have this completely independent you can create some interesting things like imagine that you say okay it's a, a football game and you want to hear the comments or not and you can 
mood one, mood different parts of the tracks, or you say, no, I want to listen to the comment, and, but from the this team, or to listen to the comment from someone from the other team, or you want to listen to the perspective of the microphone, the ambience coming from the one team or the other. So there is a lot of things that you can do uh, over there. Uh, I want to say, the third speaker was using the middle of uh, is the signal to that speaker a mix of both now the idea of having the center speaker is that it receives a completely different kind uh, of mix that you send to that speaker whatever you want so it's not something that is like uh, uh, Dolby Pro logic where you simply decode the left and right and say okay what is in common in both signals going to the left now when you of course if you use this with Dolby Pro logic that's what is going to happen and similar cases. But the idea in movies is that center channel is an independent channel. You send whatever you want to them, completely independent of all the others. Um, can you tell us uh, something about wave field synthesis? So wave field synthesis is a very interesting technique. The idea is to have like a huge number. And when I say a huge number, imagine tens and tens or even a few hundreds of speakers uh, around you and is able to do very good results. I personally never uh, listened to, to, to the experience, but everyone that I know that has experienced, they uh, rave about fantastic things. The only problem with Wavefield, besides the huge number of speakers that you need, is that um, it works great on the horizontal plane, but if you want to do the same thing with height, means that you should probably, instead of having tens or hundreds of speakers, you will probably need thousands of speakers to get the full immersive 3D experience with wave field synthesis. So most of the times what people try to do is use wave field synthesis only on the horizontal plane and then a few speakers to explore the height information. Uh, but I would like to see in the future, I don't know if, uh, if I get the lottery and get uh, rich, I can eventually create a dome with wave field synthesis fully in 3D with 10,000 speakers, that would be nice. Okay, so let's see. Um, okay, um, there's also correct difference between different speaker models. Yes, usually Genelec, GLM, also correct difference between different speaker models, okay, uh, from uh, Genelec. Um, okay, uh, what are the different size all the sound mixed the sound moving okay how do you technically do the prologic so the new version of prologic already has uh, some some features regarding Dolby atmos okay so you can uh, start playing with uh, logic with Dolby atmos uh, okay uh, loop function coming to some particles yes the next version of some particles will have a loop version loop feature and okay that's the, okay so it says that there is a question where I'm a larger room um i confess i didn't understand quite well uh, sorry but if you want can send me the 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 email and i answer you uh how can we technically use dolby atmos in logic pro x so um i've worked more with avid but i know that uh, uh, Logic has a lot of Dolby Atmos features built in with the Dolby Atmos render there. Uh, so definitely you need to check it out. Can you put a sound particles course on Groove 3? Okay, it's uh, an idea, you can think about that. Thank you. Um, let's see, I think the presentation PDF is okay. Uh, uh, okay. Okay, so thank you um, everyone. I think that's uh, uh, a wrap. So. Once again, it was a pleasure being here with you this evening talking about special audio. Once again, uh, don't forget to register for the upcoming uh, uh, event on ambisonics and binaural that is slightly more complex and they have some nuances that we are going to make easy to understand. And once again, it was a pleasure. If you want, send me an email. Uh, I will uh, I'm very keen to reply to anything that eventually I didn't mention today. So it was a pleasure and see you next week. Bye-bye.